Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, so I study biogeochemical cycles, mostly carbon in the ocean. So today we're going to talk about all different biogeochemical cycles um, and the most important ones and how they operate and how they may have changed with uh, human influence. Okay, so what is a biogeochemical cycle? So bio, it involves life, so it's anything involving life. Um, Geo, it involves the solid earth, and chemical, it involves the chemical transformations um, through each of these spheres. So through the hydrosphere, through the atmosphere, through the geosphere, um, and there's different transformations and transfers from each of these spheres, and they operate together as a closed system, but the atmosphere, for instance, is operating um, with exchanging between each of these within the the Earth system. So together, it's a closed system, and each of these um, different systems are closed together. But um, we're looking at the transformations between the atmosphere, biosphere, geosphere, and hydrosphere. So what elements are required for life? Um, so we divide them up into macronutrients and micronutrients. So macronutrients are required in large quantities and they're essential for life. Um, so as you can see in green uh, on this periodic table, those are the elements that are required for all of life forms. Um, and micronutrients are required in small amounts. So there may be not um, high concentrations and they're not essential for all life forms. And those are in the dashed green. Um, so that might be like copper that's um, required in small concentrations but not as important as something like carbon that we all need for growth. Um, so within the macronutrients, we're dividing it up into the big six. So like what's the biggest, most important um, elements that are required for life? So does anyone have any ideas of what within those green shaded um, elements, which ones are the most important? Or which is the most important? Or one of the big six? Yeah, carbon. So we have carbon's very important. We'll be talking about that today. Nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, um, sulfur, and hydrogen are the big six. So those are the ones we're mostly concerned about. Um, so carbon, as you all know, is most important because it makes up all organic compounds. Um, it's the most important and everything involves carbon. So it's in carbohydrates, um, it's in proteins and amino acids, and we also have the presence of hydrogen and oxygen, um, and nitrogen is also in part important in that. Um, we have phosphorus, which is important in ATP, um, and ADP, which is important for getting energy within the cell. Um, sulfur is important, as Julie talked about previously at mid-ocean ridges, you have these hydrothermal vents, and that's a source of, sulfur is a source of energy for those ecosystems deep in the ocean um, along the North Atlantic Ridge. So these are the most important elements that are required for life on Earth. Um, these other elements, which are seen in uh, they're shaded white on the periodic table. Those are neutral or um, maybe needed in very small concentrations for some, but not all. Um, or they can even be toxic and um, detrimental to the, to the organism. So for life to grow and to have energy, um, it needs the right amount of micronutrients the right amount of macronutrients supplied at the right time and in the right relative concentrations to each other. Um, so has anyone seen one of these trees or do they know what they're called? Sequoia, yeah. So they're huge and they're enormous and they go to like 300 feet tall and they have diameters of 50 feet. And the question is how do they get all these nutrients from the atmosphere, biosphere, and geosphere to create this huge, um, enormous structure. So I have an eye clicker question for you guys. So where does carbon come from to make up this tree? So does the carbon come from the soil? Does it come from the water? Or does the carbon come from the atmosphere? Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Good. Everybody's doing a great job. So yeah, the carbon comes from the atmosphere as you've um, through discussion, you see that carbon's incorporated through photosynthesis um, from the atmosphere. And it's incredible that given the atmosphere, it obtains enough carbon um, to build this enormous tree. So we're going to talk about how that, oops. Okay, we're going to talk about how that actually occurs. Um, oops, stop pulling. Okay. So we're going to talk about how that occurs. So the way that um, organisms actually um, and life forms, vegetation and microbes are able to get enough nutrients from their environment is to concentrate it. So that process is called bioconcentration and that's where um, organisms selectively are uptaking these macronutrients and micronutrients from their environment in higher concentrations to be able to grow. And sometimes this happens um, 100,000 times compared to its natural environment. So if you think of algae, it can concentrate iron in concentrations 100,000 times than the seawater surrounds it. And this is where it's able to accumulate enough in order to grow. Um, and so, yeah. And then through this mechanism, it ends up um, life ends up impacting the environment and actually where the distribution of these elements are located. So for instance, if you think of seashells, so seashells are grown in upwelling, like, like skeletal remains, if you guys remem remember from the exam, there'll be a lot of skeletal remains falling down from the ocean because there's upwelling and a lot of calcium is incorporated into those shells, so like coccolithophores or other organisms can grow and that will in turn affect the sedimentation and where calcium is formed or where it's located around the world. So, um, And if you think of phosphorus, it's present in organic matter and um, where those certain organisms are will act ultimately influence where you find phosphorus and um, where it's deposited into the world's sediments. Okay. So as we said before, bioconcentration is the active uptake of elements and nutrients. Um, but bioaccumulation occurs when you're adding um, nutrients more than you're being able to, to lose them. So for instance, um, in the case of mercury, this is important because um, you're actually accumulating more and uptaking more. Um, then you're able to remove it from your body, for instance. So if you look at this first graph here, this shows on the y-axis the mass of mercury remaining in an organism. And if you give this organism one pulse of mercury, then it will start to decay um, so the body can, can remove it. So you only have one dose and um, you're not accumulating anything because your body is able to remove it. Um, but if you're giving multiple doses and if you're, you know, for instance, eating small amounts um, of fish every day that have mercury in it, you're accumulating that mercury so you're not able to get rid of it. Um, so that's why it ends up that you're accumulating um, this mercury in the organism. So this is important um, in instances with fish and also in the rest of the um, the biosphere where you can accumulate these elements in your body. So this bioaccumulation leads to biomagnification and that's where um, you, a lower trophic level, for instance algae, is accumulating mercury of 10 parts per billion. And then higher trophic levels, herbivores will eat the algae and accumulate an even greater amount of mercury in it. And then the concentration increases more and more as you move higher up the trophic level. So then in a secondary carnivore, if it you know, survives that long with all that mercury in it, um, can, get, can contain concentrations of 29,000 parts per billion in it. And that's where you can actually accumulate um, and magnify the amount of mercury that's present in the ocean water um, into these organisms. 
So does anyone know what the US limits of mercury in food is? Can you just throw out a guess? Yeah? I have a feeling you have an answer. Yeah? 36. So it's close. It's 50. So, so that's pretty, su that's pretty, um, that's pretty surprising. So that's why it's important to actually eat fish not very often. And they sometimes say pregnant women shouldn't have fish because you don't want this, um, accumulation of mercury as you move higher up in trophic levels. So this was important in Minamata, Japan um, in the 1950s where um, they, they found a lot of uh, toxicity among the central nervous system of these habitants of Minamata, Japan. And this was mostly fishermen and their families um, were getting severely ill and they had um, numbness in their hands and feet, they were, they were losing their hearing, their vision and speech, and it ultimately led to death. Um, so um, investigations thought this was heavy metal poisoning, and what they found is actually there was a power plant um, producing plastics that were releasing um, mercury salts. They were using it in the chemical processing of these plastics. And they were getting washed out and depositing into the ocean. And then into the ocean, even though they were lower concentrations, they were accumulating in each level, each trophic level. So the krill would um, have levels of mercury, but then as each trophic level would eat the krill, it would be more and more concentrated um, until ultimately um, the fishermen and their families were eating this fish that was highly toxic. So. Um, that's why I put this link for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a seafood watch, and that's why it's important to check which seafood you're eating and if it's sustainable. And also, um, the EPA also advises how much of certain fish to eat. So that's why you want to eat lower in the trophic level. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about um, one of the major biogeochemical cycles, and that's phosphorus. Um, this is required for, for life, and it's one of the main limiting reagents um, for vegetation. So most, so in the boxes, it shows the, the stored amounts in millions of metric tons. So in the soils in the Earth's crust, um, that's where you have most of your phosphorus. And the phosphorus um, isn't usable to the rest of the biosphere unless it's in the form of phosphate for it. So it can be usable for these organisms to incorporate into their bodies. Um, and the way you get phosphate out of phosphorus is by chemical weathering of these rocks. Um, so then that will be, the phosphate will be um, used on land in vegetation. And then also it will run off into the ocean and um, increase productivity in the marine life. So you'll have, will um, impact the ocean biota. Um, and then it will eventually, um, these organisms will die and it will eventually go into the ocean sediments. And then again, these ocean sediments under pressure will form um, more of Earth's crust. So my question for you today is which of the sphere involved is not involved in the cycling of phosphorus. So. OK, good. Yeah, the atmosphere is not involved in this cycle. Um, so phosphate is washed out into the ocean and then deposited into the sediments. And it doesn't involve um, transport by wind into the atmosphere. And so like I said before, um, it's very important for plant growth to have a lot of phosphate so it can grow. And if you don't have enough, this will often be the limiting nutrient for growth. However, if you have too much, it can lead to eutrophication where um, you 
actually end up having assess, excessive plant growth, so you'll have blooms like in the ocean of all this marine life, and because of these blooms, they'll be using a lot of oxygen and creating these oxygen dead zones. So it will be hard for fish to live, and that's when you get a lot of fish kills. Um, and that often occurs in coastal regions where there's a lot of runoff. So, um, so does anyone know um, why we would apply so much phosphate onto the marine bio on the onto land? Yeah, fertilizer, exactly. So um, we want things to grow to support our community and our population, so we add a s excessive fertilizer to our lands that end up running off into the ocean. Um, so yeah. So one of the other um, biogeochemical cycles we'll look at is the nitrogen cycle, and this also, like phosphorus, um, phosphate is very important for growth and is often a limiting factor in plant growth. Um, so does anyone remember from studying for midterms and exams um, the percent composition of nitrogen in the atmosphere? Yeah, so 78%. So even though nitrogen is present in 78% in the atmosphere, it's often limiting um, for plant growth. And the reason that is is because um, N2 in the atmosphere is not very usable by marine life, so it's relatively inert. Um, the nitrogen in the atmosphere. So the way that this N2 from the atmosphere becomes usable to life and organisms is from the conversion of N2 to nitrate or other forms of nitrogen. Um, we call it fixed nitrogen that organisms and life can take up. So one way that occurs, this process of nitrogen fixation, um, is through lightning. So lightning accounts for about 10% of all the fixed nitrogen um, on Earth. And the other 90% is from microbes. So microbes in the soil converting this N2 into this usable form of nitrate. Um, so that's what you see here in this red arrow um, from the atmosphere into the soils. So that's where you get that usable nitrogen. And that's used in formation of land plants. It's also um, that fixed nitrogen washes out to the ocean and is used in the marine um, ecosystems and helps the marine organisms grow and the phytoplankton and plants in the ocean. Um, and then is deposited into sediments and recycled. Um, denitrification is the process where that, that nitrate um, is converted back to N2 and released back into the atmosphere. Um, so as you can see here, this is, uh, if you wait for lightning and microbes to occur, this is a really slow process and that's why um, the natural cycle would be, is limited by microbes and this, these, N fix, these nitrogen fixation um, processes. But, um, we came up with this chemical reaction, the Haber process, that's able to use nitrogen from the atmosphere to create nitrate. And this is important for fertilizer um, and growing our crops. So in this way, we've altered the cycle because like phosphate, where you're limited by the erosion of phosphorus in the rocks, um, you're limited by these microbes, but we've altered that cycle by um, providing excessive amounts of uh, nitrate to the ecosystem. So um, this figure shows in the pre-1850s how much nitrogen was available, and most of it was through natural biological fixation. And we've since doubled that since the 1900s, 1900s by um, actually, in, actually um, producing NO nitrate. Um, and most of this nitrate ends up in areas where, where we grow. So in the central of the US, where we have a lot of crops, we'll apply this fertilizer so we can grow enough and there won't be any limitations on growth. Um, and quite often, too much is applied and it will run off and be distributed. But most of it is concentrated where we have a lot of growing. Does anyone have any questions? OK. Um, 
So which of the below images does not show human-caused alteration of the nitrogen or phosphorus cycles? Um, okay, so let's look at the results. Okay, so yes. So actually, so E is the correct answer. All of them show human influences. Um, head graph. So actually D is an example of eutrophication. So that's where you have um, a lot of phosphate um, into, the, into the ocean and, or into streams and lakes. And what you have is excessive blooming um, of phytoplankton or algae. And then it will actually choke out the life because they're using all the oxygen and uh, there's, too, there's not enough oxygen for other plant life to grow. So this is basically like choked out with life and there's not enough um, nutrients. But yeah, so all of them have actually altered um, the natural cycles. And if you look at anything, the human fingerprints on all of these biogeochemical bio cycles have been altered from um, the Industrial Revolution and putting CO2 into the atmosphere and you know creating these usable forms of nitrogen and phos phosphate um, that we're often limiting in other areas. Okay, so one of the major things that we're interested in is understanding um, what will happen in the future um, due to these human these human influences that we've um, definitely altered. Um, so first, we need to understand the natural carbon cycle. So we need to know what the reservoirs are. So where is the carbon stored? Um, what the sources and sinks are in those reservoirs? So um, how is carbon added to those, those reservoirs and how is it taken away? Um, what the residence time of carbon in those reservoirs are. So how long has the carbon been there? Um, and then also any feedbacks that link carbon to climate. So like we've talked before about how you can have a positive or negative of feedback and how that will influence these reservoirs. So can anyone come up with, just name a couple of carbon reservoirs? Or one is fine. So what, what, what is a container of carbon? Our, what was that? Yeah, the ocean. The ocean is a carbon reservoir. Um, and actually, the ocean has as much carbon as the atmosphere, which is very interesting, and organic carbon. Um, so the atmosphere contains a lot of carbon. About 45% uh, of carbon is in the atmosphere. Um, about 25% is absorbed into the oceans, and about 30% is into the terrestrial biosphere. And atmospheric CO2 um, and the terrestrial biosphere and dissolved organics, um, that's dissolved organic matter from things decaying, um, is, are some of the shorter reservoirs. We also have organic carbon in soil and, and sediments, and that includes things um, yeah, like permafrost that are frozen, frozen solid earth. We also have CO2 dissolved in the ocean, so that's CO2 in the atmosphere um, interacting with the ocean and dissolving within, so that's called inorganic carbon. We have carbon that's present in limestone and sediment carbonates, and then we also have trapped organic carbon, which is um, where we get all our fossil fuels from, petroleum, carrageen, um, and when we want to know uh, these residence times of these certain reservoirs or how they respond and how quickly the carbon is contained in those reservoirs or how long they've stayed there, um, we look at residence time, which is the amount inside the reservoir over the total sources or sinks. So like we've talked about before with this tub, how much water is in the reservoir and how much is removed by you know, either a leak or is being added. So that's how we can determine the, resi the residence time of these large reservoirs and how they may respond. So they cycle, the carbon in these reservoirs that I just showed you cycle on different time scales. 
So the carbon in the atmosphere will respond differently and cycle on a different time scale than the carbon in, that is contained in sediments, for instance. So they can be short term from seasons to years. Um, they can be midterm from decades to centuries, or they can be long term from centuries to millions of years. So uh, you guys can talk amongst yourselves. And what I've done here is put up a list of um, each of these carbon sources and sinks and that occur on Earth. And you guys can break up into to groups or talk amongst yourselves um, and put these different sources and sinks and organize them between short-term, mid-term, and long-term time scales of um, cycling. So, and I guess we'll walk around and uh, help you guys with any questions. So it seems like everyone is it on. So it seems like everyone had some really good discussions and conversations um, about this. Um, so when we're talking short, short term of seasons to years, that would be something like photosynthesis and respiration, where it's t uptaking CO2. Um, and it's on much shorter time scales than something, for instance, like cycling of carbon in the deep ocean. Um, so if you remember back to the deep ocean circulation, you have water sinking through the formation of this North Atlantic deep water because it's getting cold and salty, and it's sinking and it's traversing around the entire globe and then resurfacing in the north at the north central pacific not central the north pacific um, and that's a much longer time scale that's a thousand years so that's that carbon is going to be tied away for a thousand years opposed to carbon that's in trees a much shorter time scales you know when you have a forest fire or the tree dies and is decomposed um, so um, so other short time scales is burning of forest fires, volcanic eruptions, dissolution in the surface ocean, um, midterm uh, time scales of carbon cycling is this a thousand years for uh, cycling of carbon. Um, cycling of carbon in soils is also on uh, intermediate time scales, and land use and vegetation changes. Uh, our longer time scale uh, changes are cycling of carbon in the deep ocean, the chemical weathering and erosion of rocks, um, formation of sediments and rocks, um, and then formation of our fossil fuels, which take a long time um, to form. So the different sources and sinks of carbon are very important and also their residence time within these pools are important to understand the natural carbon system so we can understand how things may change when we're um, adding more carbon to the system by burning this fossil fuel. And like we've talked before when we've talked about uh, Earth being a closed system, you can't take carbon from fossil fuels and not have it show up someplace else. So when we're burning fossil fuels, it's showing up in the atmosphere and um, in one system, all of them are affected. So do you see here, the smaller, the smaller reservoirs have the shortest uh, residence times, whereas the residence times are centuries to millennials for these intermediate carbon pools. And the larger the carbon pool, um, the slower residence time it has, so the slower it takes to change these pools. So now we're going to talk about feedbacks within these carbon pools and how um, those change climate, whether they're a positive or negative feedback. So we're increasing CO2 concentrations into the atmosphere, and that's leading to increased temperatures because it's a greenhouse gas. And these increased temperatures increase the fluxes and exchanges between those other reservoirs that I just showed on the previous slide. Um, so some examples of this is increased air temperatures lead to methane release from permafrost, permafrost thawing. So permafrost is um, loca located up north in the northern latitudes, and it's this soil that's been frozen, and it contains a lot of carbon, um, and it's a large carbon pool. But as we're increasing temperatures, this permafrost is starting to thaw, 
and microbes are getting involved in it and decomposing and you're releasing, making some of that previously frozen carbon now available to the ecosystem. Another example is increased CO2 in the atmosphere it leads to increased plant growth through photosynthesis. Um, so you have more CO2 in the atmosphere so it's easier for plant stomatas um, to uptake this CO2 for photosynthesis like we talked about uh, in your discussion. So you're actually um, requiring CO2 for photosynthesis and if there's more CO2 it's easier for plants to grow. And that's called um, CO2 fertilization. And ocean temperatures increase so then the amount of CO2 dissolved in oceans actually decrease. So if you think of a can of soda on a hot day, if you open the can of soda and let it sit out, what will happen to it? Will, will it, will it be really tasty, you know, or, you know, something not very good? Yeah, so it will be flat because the CO2, um, it's easier to dissolve CO2 into colder temperature uh, liquids. Um, and then ocean temperatures increase and this can thaw uh, methane containing ice which is located in continental shelves. So the ocean temperature will be warmer and it will start to release the methane that's contained in these um, areas of ice under the ocean. And they're also known as methane hydrates. So let's talk a little bit in more detail about each of these feedbacks in the carbon cycle that we're interested in. Um, so CO2 dissolves more readily in colder waters. So uh, as you can see here, so this is a figure of the amount of air sea uh, CO2 flux. So that's the amount of CO2 that's being drawn into the ocean. So the, the purple bluish colors represent where you're, you're withdrawing or you're drawing in a lot of CO2 into the ocean. So you're taking a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere and dissolving it into the ocean. And that occurs in the colder areas. And you're releasing CO2 um, out from the ocean in warmer temperatures. So that's what you see in red. So with warmer temperatures, um, we may not be able to sequester or draw in as much CO2 in the atmosphere as we have. And this, um, this is really important because this uptakes about 20% of the CO2 in the atmosphere. Another feedback that I previously mentioned is um, warmer ocean temperatures can thaw these methane hydrates in the continental shelves and sediments. So um, there's about two times the amount of methane dissolved, I mean not dissolved, um, contained in these methane hydrates and we're warming these temperatures. And that's a huge amount of methane that we can release back into the atmosphere. Um, that's more than all the known fossil fuels, twice the amount. Um, so they're very flammable and uh, you can light them, <laughs> that's what you see here. Um, so which of these is a negative feedback on the ca carbon in the atmosphere? So is it, is it increased air temperature leads to methane release from permafrost thawing? Increased CO2 in the atmosphere leads to increased plant growth? Ocean temperatures increase so dissolved CO2 decreases? Um, ocean temperatures increase and can melt methane hydrates from sediments on continental shelves. Okay, a couple more minutes. Okay. Display. Okay, great. Yeah. So C is the negative feed is the negative feedback. So um, when ocean temperatures when ocean temperatures increase, you're not able to remove as much CO2 from the atmosphere because you're not able to um, actually dissolve all that CO2 in the ocean. So the ocean's not able to take up as much carbon as if it were a colder climate system. So that would be the negative feedback um, because it actually 
Okay. Oops. Okay, so what have humans done to the carbon cycle? So we've increased uh, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by adding 280 a billion tons of carbon since 1990, and we now add six to seven billion tons of carbon per year now. Um, we've also changed the way we've used land by deforesting. So in, the in 1620, there was more forests um, on the U.S. since the 1920s when we've started changing the way land is used with the inputs of crops and cutting out um, a lot of forests. So that has released 200 billion tons of carbon since 1850 into the atmosphere by deforestation. And now we add 0.5 to 2 billion tons of carbon per year. Um, so one of the most interesting and like most significant data sets of the century is this Keeling curve. So Keeling was from Scripps in San Diego and he went out to Mauna Loa in Hawaii to measure the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And he chose it from a place that was high and, a, and away from any sources of local pollution so he could actually measure the background CO2 concentrations. Um, and this is important because the CO2 is well mixed so he's able to measure um, the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And one thing he saw is these wiggles. And these wiggles are actually related to the terrestrial biosphere where you have photosynthesis taking up CO2 in the summer months um, and then respiration and decomposition releasing CO2 during the winter months. So that's where you see a decrease of CO2 during the winter months and an uh, eventual increase. Um, but this in steadily increase with time actually shows the accumulation of CO2 um, by anthropogenic combustion um, because the sources are anthropogenic combustion, respiration, and we see a, a background increase. Um, and this was the most important because prior to the 1950s, people thought that all this burning of fossil fuels would just be absorbed by the ocean because the sinks are uh, photosynthesis and within the ocean. And here we actually see an increase um, that we'll, we'll talk about in further detail next class. Thank you.